Hey everybody, uh, this is David Schmidt and thank you so much for being here this evening. And uh, we are gonna be going over X39 stem cells, light therapy, uh, the mechanisms behind how all of this works. And I think you're gonna find it really interesting because we're gonna be exploring uh, some very interesting material together. So uh, with that, let's go ahead and get started. Now, I thought where we might start this evening, uh, since there are so many uh, scientific minded individuals on the line today, I understand we have quite a few healthcare practitioners on the line with us, thought I might dig a little bit deeper into this presentation on the science than what we might normally do. So when we're talking about light therapy, what is so exciting about this is the idea that we can trigger very specific biochemical changes in the body with light. And we think about this, this is really extraordinary. If we looked at the pharmaceutical model, we know that a uh, pharmacologist could spend their entire career, they could spend 20 years trying to figure out how to engineer and create a new drug to activate a specific receptor in the cell to produce a specific effect. So what's exciting about this is that we can use light to initiate biochemical changes in the body. And of course, because we're not introducing any foreign chemicals, there aren't going to be any side effects to this. Um, so let's, let's dig into this in a little bit more detail. How exactly does this work? Well, first thing is we often use the analogy that uh, everyone accepts that you go out in the sun and sunlight is going to trigger a release of vitamin D. So very clear example that we all know to be true of how light will cause a chemical change in the body. Uh, this area is known as photobiomodulation. And one thing that's very interesting is that if we go back 10 years ago, the biochemical mechanisms for photobiomodulation, or another way we can think of it is low-level light therapy, the biochemical mechanisms weren't really very well understood. If we go back 20 years ago, light therapy was relegated to the area of quackery. Uh, traditional scientists thought, no, this is a placebo effect. There's really nothing to it. And today, uh, with over 5,000 clinical studies that have been published with people like Dr. Michael Hamblin at Harvard University doing pioneering research. Uh, Dr. Hamblin has over 400 clinical studies that are published. The mechanisms by which light therapy works and produces these changes are very well understood. Um, our company, LifeWave, has performed over 80 clinical studies in the last 18 years. So we have created an enormous body of scientific research that tells us how the patches work. Okay, well, let's just start over here. Uh, we see we have uh, different wavelengths of light. And in this example, uh, the wavelengths are in the near infrared band, but uh, we can see uh, cellular change in the visible band of light as well. But what's generally accepted is that, and what has been demonstrated and shown, is that wavelengths of light in the near infrared are going to increase produ production of cytochrome C oxidase. And this is, of course, uh, very significant and important because of cytochrome C oxidase's, oxidase's role in the electron transport chain. And the electron transport chain, of course, uh, is involved in producing energy from carbohydrates and fats in the mitochondria. So net end result is that we can use light to elevate energy production in the cell. And as a result, that net increase in energy in the cell can be used to drive different chemical processes. So if we want to, in our case, synthesize a naturally occurring peptide in the cell, this is gonna be the pathway under which we're gonna do that. And sorry, I know I'm going fast. I'm, I'm trying to get a lot of information in, in a short period of time. 
Now, as I mentioned, there are thousands of studies that are going to be in the literature. We're not going to have the time this evening, of course, to, to do an exhaustive uh, accounting of all those studies. But just suffice it to say that here would be an example of a study where uh, using near infrared light to elevate cytochrome C oxidase is, uh, is demonstrated and shown. And you can see that in the, the results of the study when you scroll down. Okay, now, why should we be concerned about this? Well, uh, one of the reasons is that if we are interested in stem cells and regeneration, and we want to avoid some of the negative effects of stem cells, meaning that um, you inject stem cells, they're expensive. They don't always work. There can be contraindications. Sometimes the stem cells will divide in ways that are not beneficial or, or healthy. This certainly happened in the early days of stem cells. Uh, what if we could use light to elevate a peptide known to influence the activity of stem cells in the body? And that's exactly what we're doing here. Now, Dr. Lauren Picard has spent over 45 years investigating copper peptide. Uh, as a matter of fact, he is the scientist that discovered copper peptide. And there's two peptides here that we're interested in, GHK and GHKCU. The difference is that uh, what we've seen in our studies, which I'll show you in a moment, is that first X39 will elevate GHK and then GHK will bond with copper ions. It has a very high affinity for copper and both GHK and GHKCU are going to show um, a number of metabolic benefits, but specifically we're gonna look at the role of GHKCU in uh, stem cells. So here is a study that I think you would find of interest because it shows the role uh, of GHK in regeneration. This was published in 2015. And the mechanism is extraordinarily interesting. When we think about how are human beings going to benefit from stem cell therapy, we often think in terms of injecting young, healthy cells into the body. And that's certainly one way to do it. But what if we could take the endogenous, naturally occurring stem cells that are already in our body and get them to function like younger, healthier cells? And this is one of the really exciting things about copper peptide. You can see here that one of the things that was discovered by Dr. Picard is that about 4,000 genes are regulated, either up or down regulated, but essentially resetting those genes to a younger, healthier state. So this means that the stem cells can behave like younger, healthier cells. Here's a later study that was published in 2018. And when Dr. Picard began to see the uh, regenerative effects of copper peptide, he then of course naturally concluded that uh, copper peptide must be showing a role in stem cells. And of course, uh, it turned out that he was correct. And what is actually going on here? Several things uh, to be very interested in. First, copper peptide is gonna reset cells to a younger, healthier state by altering gene expression then those stem cells are mobilized through increased expression of P63. And here is a study that was actually looking at that. Uh, what happens when you elevate copper peptide in the skin? Now, not only will copper peptide increase the ability of stem cells to get to an injury site, but in addition, copper peptide has been found to revert the stem cells in the skin to pluripotent stem cells. So this means the total number of circulating stem cells increases. And in other studies that have been published, 
uh, this leads to regeneration of damaged tissue. So we, of course, have done a significant number of studies and you can find them here. We're not gonna have time to go over all of these this evening. Uh, we have nine clinical studies that we've uh, completed so far on X39. Because of COVID, there have been delays in getting those published. Uh, we have one in particular I'm really excited about. It's a 50 person uh, double blind study on looking at X39 on how it elevates copper peptide. We have the predecessor to that uh, that you can see here that was published. But basically what we show is that within the first 24 hours, X39 elevates GHK. And this is why when you look at metabolic studies that we've done on X39, it shows that most people are gonna start to feel results in as little as 24 hours and vast majority within the first seven days. Okay, let's back up a little bit here. And let's restate this problem. The problem is that as we age, the stem cells are aging with us. This of course has to do with the Hayflick limit. There's a limited number of times that cells can divide and the stem cells are subject to the Hayflick limit along with the rest of the cells. So quite simply, when we get to around age 70, age 75, our cells stop dividing. And this is really bad news. Anybody that uh, has gotten over the age of 60 or 70 knows that their ability and their capacity to heal and uh, recover from an injury has slowed down dramatically. This is a result of a degradation in the quality of the stem cells, their ability to proliferate, their ability to release growth factors. And eventually, of course, we don't have any more stem cells. So most of the solutions that companies are looking at is let's take young, healthy stem cells and inject them into the body. And there is not a major success that of this that's available today. Most uh, governments have not approved stem cell therapy. There's only limited, very limited approvals. Most of this has to do with uh, bone marrow transplants. And that's because there are significant risks that are associated with injecting stem cells. If they don't divide uh, the way that they're intended to be used, they could divide into, um, into cells that are not supposed to be in the tissue where they are injected. So for example, in Japan, um, there has been ongoing research into Parkinson's disease. And there's a human study going on right now where a needle is inserted into the brain and stem cells are injected directly into the brain. Well, when this research first started, stem cells divided into muscle tissue, liver tissue, hair, and the animals ended up dying because the stem cells uh, divided from a pluripotent state down into a, a multipotent state that was uh, not desirable. The, the division was uncontrolled. So these are some of the risks associated with stem cell science as it is today. But of course, that's gonna change in the future. So what we wanna do is make stem cell, uh, stem cell science affordable, safe, effective, and available to everybody. So how are we going to do that? Well, as Robin was saying, um, I have over 100 patents now. I reached that milestone this year. Uh, those are 100 issued global patents uh, with many more that are pending. And over 70 of those are just in the field of stem cells and regenerative medicine. And we've spent over $4 million over the last 12 years in developing X39. And research, of course, is ongoing as we find new ways to utilize uh, our technology with respect to stem cells. Some of the early research we did was with the National University of Ireland in Galway at their Regenerative Medicine Institute. 
Uh, this research was actually funded by Scientific Foundation Ireland. And Remedy, uh, by the way, and uh, NUIG is in the top 2% of universities globally in the field of stem cell research. So when you go over to the west coast of Ireland and you're at this institute, you can find um, all of the major healthcare companies doing research there. In any case, this is a technology that I invented and we developed at our laboratories in uh, San Diego. And this is a novel form of electromagnetic therapy that we have shown can mobilize and activate stem cells. This was a uh, standard rabbit model that we used after we went from our, um, our initial laboratory work. And the goal here was to see if we could uh, upregulate or increase the rate of wound healing in these rabbits. So a diabetic ulceration was formed uh, over a period of seven days. And then we had a control group and a group that was treated with this electromagnetic coil. And we looked at the rates of regeneration. And in this very first trial, uh, we were able to hit statistical significance and see that just using energy, we could activate the stem cells. We didn't need to use a stem cell injection. Now, what was also really significant about this study is that when you apply stem cells directly to uh, the site of a ulceration, the rate of wound closure is identical to applying an external electromagnetic field. So this was the first indication that we had that you didn't have to give a stem cell injection. And that was really exciting. We could use energy to activate the stem cells in a body and accelerate wound healing, plus all of the other amazing benefits associated with stem cells. Now at our labs in San Diego, we use a standard stem cell model. This is a planaria and uh, planaria have remarkable regenerative capabilities as a result of the uh, sheer number of stem cells that are located in their bodies. And when you cut off the head of a planaria, it will regenerate in 17 days. The stem cell community is trying to figure out how can we get that down to 15 days? If we could do it maybe in a planaria, maybe we could do it in human beings. Well, this technology that I just showed you, we were able to get the regeneration down to eight days and then eventually under one day. So imagine that, being able to regenerate the head of a worm in less than one day. What if we could apply a technology like that to human beings. That's gonna be, of course, our ultimate goal. But this technology is very expensive. And so we want to be able to offer an affordable way for people to uh, activate stem cells. So how do we do that? And how would this technology work? I'll take a glass of water. Okay, well, we are gonna to turn to light therapy for the answer to this because I have been developing light therapy products now uh, for 20 years. We have quite a bit of experience and knowledge in how to activate different biochemical pathways in the body with light. And uh, we wanna look at how can we do this? What are the control mechanisms for stem cells in the body? So the way this works is that instead of using a lamp or an LED uh, or any type of electronic device, we're going to use a passive patch. You simply apply the patch to the body and the patch will stimulate the skin with light. So we're not putting any chemicals from the patch into the body. The materials in the patch are completely sealed and these materials are activated by your body heat. 
the patch will stimulate the skin with light and produce a biochemical change. So just like sunlight will cause the body to make vitamin D, this technology will stimulate the skin with light, elevate copper peptide, and this will activate the stem cells. And by the way, for the practitioners that are here this evening, when we use the term activate, this is just another way of saying that we are enhancing the ability of the stem cells to proliferate and go to where they're needed. And that of course is gonna be the site of uh, inflammatory cytokines uh, where there's an injury. We know stem cells are attracted to the, those uh, type of, uh, that type of inflammation. So very simple way to think about this is that this is a new form of low level light therapy. And we're using low level light to elevate GHKCU or copper peptide. And so of course the advantages of copper peptide are extraordinary. We get to reset thousands of genes to a younger, healthier state. As a matter of fact, uh, in early research, if you were to take the, uh, for example, liver cells from somebody 75 or 80 years old, put them in a solution of copper peptide, those cells start to behave like younger, healthier cells. If all we were doing with X39 was just simply allowing old stem cells to get to an injury, that of course would not be very effective. So what really uh, makes this product effective is the fact that copper peptide is a very powerful gene modulator, can get those stem cells to act like younger, healthier cells. And of course, now they can release growth factors, they, their motility rate increases, and uh, people can experience healing at ages when normally they would not be able to. Okay, so we've got nine studies on X39. Uh, first question is, how do we know that the X39 patch elevates copper peptide? So that was one of the first studies we did. It actually uh, took us about a year to get through just method development. So we had developed, uh, had to develop methods. We worked with two different laboratories and uh, these were microanalytical labs. And first we looked at urine analysis. Uh, could we detect copper peptide in the urine? Uh, then eventually we landed on doing blood studies and uh, the method development led to a procedure uh, where we could detect copper peptide in blood. So this was our first pilot study, it was with 10 people. We've since repeated this and uh, we have a double blind study now. Generally, when we wanna look at copper peptide levels, uh, we like to have people that are over the age of 50 or 60. The reason is copper peptide levels are going to be much lower in that group. So if we were gonna compare copper peptide levels to people over the age of 60, compared to people in their 20s, uh, levels of copper peptide are down 60 to 80% when someone's over the age of 60. We also want to find out if, you know, this is light therapy, so we should be able to see an effect rapidly. So we want to look at uh, taking a baseline and then doing another blood draw 24 hours later, and then uh, as, a, as a matter of convenience, we look at uh, a seven day period. And very clearly uh, what we see to statistical significance is that within the first 24 hours, we see increases in GHK. We also see increases in GHKCU, but not to statistical significance at 24 hours. But of course, by, at day seven, uh, we are well into statistical significance. Now we've also uh, done metabolic testing with X39. And this is important. Uh, this was a, uh, we did two studies here. The first was a pilot. The second was a uh, 50 person double blind. Again, mean age was over the age of uh, 60. And we wanna look at short-term benefits. What happens to the metabolism 
in the first 24 hours and in the first seven days. Well, one thing we were interested in was looking at synthesis of amino acids. And we saw that uh, amino acids were upregulated. So for example, we looked at the branch chain amino acids like leucine, isoleucine, and valine. And this was important uh, because we had anecdotal information that athletes were recovering much more quickly from exercise. So we saw about a 30 to 40% increase in upregulation of leucine. So I think we've got some pretty good evidence that uh, through elevating leucine, we're activating mTOR, increasing muscle protein synthesis. And of course, this is gonna be very valuable, not only in recovery, but also for any athlete or anyone that wants to improve performance. Um, as another example, we also see, saw an upregulation of tryptophan. And uh, that was interesting because in the early days of studying X39, we saw uh, that people were getting improved levels of sleep. We eventually measured GABA levels and we saw GABA levels being upregulated as well. So uh, we indeed were able to uh, determine why people were experiencing improvements in their quality of sleep. Uh, we also saw improvements in memory with X39, and I'm gonna show you another study, a separate study that we did looking at the brain. Um, very interesting, we saw statistically significant decreases in blood pressure in people that had elevated blood pressure. We also did measurements with heart rate, heart rate variability. And uh, for those of you that are not familiar with that, that looks at the uh, ratio of muscle contractions in the four chambers of the heart. And this is important because heart rate variability uh, can detect abnormalities uh, in the function of the heart. And we saw improvements in heart rate variability. Uh, overall vitality, we saw improved. Even uh, breathing improved. Okay, and then on the brain mapping, and I'm going through this quickly so we can get to your questions. Um, we can actually you know, do a much deeper dive <laughs> into each of these studies, um, but just going through quickly, because I know uh, there are a lot of questions tonight. Uh, we have the privilege of working with Dr. Gaetan Chevalier. We've been working uh, with Dr. Chevalier now for over 10 years. And uh, Melinda Connor, actually, Dr. Melinda Connor, we've been working with her for about 10 years as well. Uh, incredible researchers, and it's a privilege to work with, with them and their teams. Well, Dr. Chevalier was doing research into nuclear fusion at UCLA. He's an expert in laser spectroscopy. And uh, some of our early studies that we did with him were looking at biophoton emission. And we saw that with our LifeWave energy enhancer patches, we could actually bring the cells into greater coherence and this would improve biophoton emission from the cells. So this is a uh, very powerful anti-aging effect. Uh, we also had run a study looking at upregulation of mitochondrial function. We did that study with Dr. Frank Schallenberger and uh, Dr. Homer Nazaran. At the, uh, at the time, Dr. Nazaran was at the University of Texas in El Paso, their biomedical engineering department. And uh, so we saw directly that stimulating the skin with light would increase mitochondrial function. Any case, in this study, what we wanted to do was uh, use a P300, it says here P3, it was a P300 EEG brain mapping system. Uh, this was the pilot study. Uh, there were some delays in getting started with the double blind uh, because of COVID, but now the double blind study on this is underway. Uh, one thing that's important is that all 12 people in this open label study had dramatic effects. And we worked with people over the age of 60. And this is really significant because we would not expect, even with the effects of neuroplasticity, 
we would not expect to see a changes this dramatic in a uh, section of the population that is over the age of 60 and 70. But here uh, at session one is baseline, session two is at three weeks, and session three is at six weeks. And what's happening is that the brain is shifting into a greater state of coherence. When, if we want to solve the problem of aging, the problem of aging can really be thought as a state of our bodies going from perfection, from the divine design, from a state of coherence and balance into a state of disorganization. And we see this over time, the degradation of the structure of the cells. Well, what would happen if we could reverse that and bring greater coherence to the cells and of course on the macro level as well? And this is what we see with our products that they establish greater coherence. And this is some proof of that. Here's the 67 year old man. Now I wanna highlight the difference between these two because most people are gonna see results with X39 within the first week and their first month using the product, uh, most people are gonna get great results. Some people, however, require a little bit more time, maybe about 10 or 15% of the population. So if you have a patient that's using X39 and they don't see the results the first three or four weeks, um, that would not necessarily be unusual. You can see by session three here at six weeks, already there's a, a very significant improvement as compared to baseline. So some people are gonna take a little bit longer, but it's only about 10 or 15% of the population. Okay, and then just moving quickly now, uh, many of you might've already seen these testimonials, so we'll go quickly through them but some of the dramatic effects we see with X39 are in the area of wound healing. So sometimes it can be a scar that's more than a year old. Even uh, we've had people with scars that were 18 years old. They still saw a dramatic reduction in the appearance or here this is uh, just after two weeks on a more recent scar. X39 can be applied behind the neck, below the belly button, um, and it will produce a systemic effect. Some people prefer to put the patch at the site of an injury, and of course, that's fine too. So this is a young man who had a job interview coming up, and uh, he was in an accident, and you can see within five days, he experienced a dramatic result. This one's really extraordinary. I was meeting with a doctor yesterday and we were discussing a uh, study on X39 and I showed him this picture and he was absolutely blown away. Here's a gentleman that was in a car accident, nearly lost his hand, and yet two months later, virtually no sign of that injury. So this is the power of resetting stem cells to a younger, healthier state. This is also, I mean, just incredible. This is a young boy, uh, nine years old in Denmark, caught his finger in a door, had it severed off. The doctors reattached it. Uh, you can see initially it turned black. The parents applied X39. And only two months later, the finger is back to normal. Uh, the doctor was astounded and said they didn't think uh, that this was possible. And even still, they would have expected more like a nine month recovery. Now, of course, stem cells, while they do a great job with wound healing, uh, they certainly have very, very powerful anti-aging effects. And one of the things that stem cells do really well is make collagen. Of course, collagen is uh, the most abundant protein in the body. And, um, we know that as we age, there is a decrease 
in our levels of collagen, and hence uh, this is going to lead partially, that's going to lead to formation of lines and wrinkles. And uh, this is a woman, her name is Mandy. She is in Australia. And you can see very dramatic result after six weeks. And uh, she was thrilled with the results. She continued to use X39. And you can see dramatic change after one year. Now, this was actually the very first I'll call it youth renewal testimonial that we received on X39. Uh, this woman lives in Denmark, she's 93. Uh, her daughter is a LifeWave distributor. Uh, she was, uh, the mom here was dealing with a number of very significant health challenges. And so the daughter gave her X39 in the hopes that it could help support her health. And everyone was truly shocked at the transformation that she went through in only two months. So this is all to say that through our research and through practice, we have found that uh, you don't have to have injections of stem cells, that activating the stem cells with copper peptide can lead to remarkable health benefits. Uh, one area that we are interested in exploring actually is well, what happens when you elevate copper peptide and you give a stem cell injections? Would the benefits be even greater? That's an area that we uh, tend to explore in our clinical research. Uh, we, we tend to feel that there could be some synergies there that are really worth exploring. <clears throat> 